Hello, this is your host, Michelle Jasami Bookworm Podcast. Today is Friday, the 23rd of September, and I want to wish Ruth Denzi a very happy birthday. This podcast is dedicated to you. Thank you so much. Hello, this is Michelle Smith at Dasami Publishing, and once again, we are on episode 18 of the Dasami Bookworm podcast. I am so delighted to uh, introduce Ruth Denzi, who is Chef Ruth Denzi throughout her life, and we'll be getting into that in more detail. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So, uh, We'll ask a few uh, personal questions and then we're going to get to uh, the reason behind the cookbook that we're producing for you. The thing I'd like to know first is uh, when did you first want to become a chef and how did you go about it? (laughs) Well, to be honest, I didn't want to become a chef originally. Um, Well, I grew up in Cambridge and I was a member of the Cambridge Youth Theatre and I loved drama and acting. And um, when it came to time for to leave school, my parents said, yeah, we'll help you and support you to go to RADA or whatever. But before you do that, you need to do something else that you can fall back on if you don't make it in in acting or whatever. And I thought, "Mm, I quite like cooking. I quite enjoyed cooking at school. I'll go and do a catering course. I got on into the Cambridge College of Arts and Technology, uh, signed up for the catering course and won the College Cup in the first year for what I'd done uh, and thought, actually, I quite like this. So I did my two years uh, and then I did another two years part time to specialise in patisserie. Uh, And by that stage, I was completely hooked on cooking. And it's been an absolute part of my life. It's been my whole life, really. I think I think I kind of express myself through food. I understand that from, you know, chefs and those who love to cook so much that it it isn't it isn't a job you do, it's who you are. So that's yeah. what you are is a chef. Now, with the difference in patisserie, you said you focused on that. How did you decide that you wanted to do that? And, and what are the main differences to someone who's a neophyte, sorry, when it comes to the cooking? <laughs> um, well, when you've done your first two years, they ask you if you want to specialize. And at that point, uh, there was two specialities. One was patisserie and the other one was larder. Uh, and larder involved things like game, how to skin and gut game and things. And whilst, you know, I'm not squeamish and I'll, I'm prepared to do it, I thought, I think I'd prefer to do patisserie because it's just a bit more fun and more pleasant to eat afterwards. So I just I just got involved with patisserie, although I haven't really specialised in patisserie during my career as such. I just love to cook. I love food. And I think most people, I think it might be a way, as I say, it's part of my character. And I think it's because you want to please, I think people that, that are chefs and cook want to please people and they almost want affirmation when you put something down in front of people and they go oh that's that's fabulous it's kind of like yep <laughs> i did something good <laughs> that absolutely i agree with that because when someone if a beautiful plate of food you know is in front of me i just so appreciate all the work that's gone into it because mm-hmm. that does it you know i've tried a few things in my life and uh it takes forever and the the kitchen you usually looks like a bomb site hit it. Uh, so, and it's not, you know, it, it, sometimes it actually turns out quite tasty, but the effort and the time and the thought mm-hmm. and design, um, I will confess to master chef, but I look at how they design the plates. So yes. patisserie is very, well, it's all creative, but that there's so many little intricacies in that. What was, what was the hardest part about patisserie? Uh, I think you have to be very disciplined because unlike with some normal dishes, you can kind of go, oh, chuck a bit of this in and maybe a bit of that. Whereas with patisserie, because it's a science, all all cooking is a science. It's it's physics, it's chemistry. It's how things react to each other. And with pastry work, you have to get your measurements right because, and you have to get your ingredients right because they all really interact. Whereas if you're doing a casserole or something, if you chuck a bit more red wine in or something, or you change your mushrooms for some peppers or something it doesn't really make a difference but when it comes to pastry work 
you do have to pretty much follow a recipe pretty closely because it is it's, it's a science well in in watching the baking shows you know when they're making sugar they've got the thermometer right in there yeah, uh, yeah. so that is and they it's exact you have to put the exact ingredients in it and such mm -hmm. what's the most enjoyable part of patisserie for you ruth uh, well, I think most people have got a sweet tooth, and so everybody pretty much loves pastry or patisserie. Not everybody, you know, not everybody likes tripe or liver or other things that you do, but there's not many things that if people like sweet things, they like nearly all sweet things. Uh, so, and, and everyone likes a little bit of indulgence, and if you know, pastry work and patisserie is kind of indulgent. It's not something you have to eat every day. Yes, and it is a special treat. So when you were going for your degree, was was the final you had to create a special recipe? Yeah, we had to do we had to do sort of special recipes. We also had to um, um, go with the hotel and catering um, exhibition every year. All the colleges used to enter enter people for the hotel and catering exhibition. So we had to do dishes for that and get them judged and things as well. So it taught you pretty a good deal of discipline and sort of how to present things. And when you, how did you use, now you say that you've done lots of different kinds of cooking. Did you do patisserie in any work for, in a bakery or anything along those lines? Not in a bakery as such, although when um, I first got married and moved out of London, uh, we started, an out, I start, uh, my husband and I, ex-husband and I, started an outside catering business. And a lot of that involved patisserie because it's sort of, it was supplying local local cake shops and, and bistros and things. So we used to do a lot of things like cheesecakes and uh, eclairs and yeah, a lot of uh, quiches and things as well, but mostly desserts and sweet stuff to, for cake shops and things. Uh, but but I've kind of mostly done everything really. When I first left college, I actually didn't really go into catering as such. I went into food product development and I worked for Spullers developing new products, um, cooking sauce, home pride cooking sauces. I don't know if you remember them. <laughs> I worked on those way, way, way back. Uh, but it, so it was actually, they were quite innovative in that, I think at that point, women were having to go out to work more. And actually, it, it, people did need shortcuts to make decent food. Unfortunately, I think we've gone far too far the other way now. But at least with things like cooking sauces, you still had fresh ingredients, but you added the sauce to make an interesting dish without having to spend hours producing the sauce. So they were quite a good idea. But I think now, and all, with so many sort of pre-made, everything's, everything's pre-made, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to cook at all, which I think is a real shame. And I think it's actually adding to the health crisis because people don't know how to cook anymore. And don't, they have an like, interest in cooking, but they don't necessarily have the time. And it's finding things that you can do in a short space of time when you get home from work, but you want something healthy without just going to the supermarket and picking up a ready-made thing that you shove in the microwave. Uh, I'll agree with you there. I don't, uh, I don't buy ready-made meals. Um, mm. If I'm, uh, I have an air fryer and I will admit to short and fast is great for me. And yeah. I have the George Foreman grill and I do steaks on there. And then I do things in the, you know, that make it crispy like chips and that yeah. are fresh because I'll buy fresh potatoes. I'll buy fresh meat, fresh fish and you put the fish in there and that's wonderful. So that kind of works. It's fast food without being unhealthy and it's not processed. Exactly, exactly. and there's a lot, but I don't think people realize there's an awful lot of things that you can cook within 20 minutes. You can, you can knock together a, a, a good healthy meal in 20 minutes buying fresh ingredients, but you do need to sort of have some good recipes or have, an idea, have a vague understanding of how things work. Yes, and that's where we get recipe books from, which we're going to talk about <laughs> you, uh, yours in a minute, the cookbooks, and, you know, from all the different designs, and I love listening to recipes. So I have one uh, pastry question uh, about that. We'll go back to the cookbook. What is the most difficult uh, patisserie that you've ever done that you said, no, don't want to do that anymore? Um... Well, a, a lot of people find shoe pastry difficult, but actually once you once you get an understanding of it, it's not that difficult. But making something like a croquembouche, which is the stacked shoe pastries all glued together with, with caramel and what have you, 
it's not so much that they're difficult, they're just time consuming and they are technical. Once you've mastered the technique, it's straightforward. But and again, it's practice with anything like this. The first time most people make shoe pastry, it's a complete disaster. Once you learn the, the, the basic rules of it, you don't go, you can't go wrong. It's, it's simple, but it's known the basic, everything, it, all patisserie is known the basic rules. And that's what comes down to the recipes. And, and now we're going to talk about your cookbook that right. we will be producing for you. The important question is, Ruth, uh, why did you want to do this particular cookbook? Right. Well, I was diagnosed with ovarian can incurable ovarian cancer seven years ago. Uh, and my uh, doctor said that I would have a 20% chance of surviving five years. Um, I've done seven. Uh, but when obviously I spoke to my children and one thing or another, one of the first things my daughter was said was, well, you're not dying until you give me all your recipes because I, <laughs> I, want, you know, I want this and I want that. And uh, during COVID and lockdown, I was bored and I thought, actually, I might just start putting a few of these recipes online. And it developed from there. I, I started a, a Facebook page, Ruth's Recipes, started putting a few on and more and more people saying, oh, that's great. Do some more. And a lot of them were the ones that my daughter wanted. And then after that, hello. Well, my daughter said uh, after I've been diagnosed that she didn't want, she wanted me to leave her, leave her all the recipes, um, things like suet dumplings and just stuff that, that I'd always cooked for her. Uh, and she had no idea how to, how to do them. And uh, I also got quite bored during COVID and decided that I might just put some things on Facebook and do a Facebook page called Ruth's Recipe. Uh, and it got more and more popular. And I thought, well, maybe I should do something with it uh, and raise some money at the same time and decided that I would turn it into a cookbook. Most of the recipes from the Facebook page, turn it into a cookbook and, and any, any money from it would go to Macmillan Cancer. That is such a wonderful legacy to leave not only for your children and, and grandchildren and the rest of your family, but also for the world to enjoy, you know, someone that understands about, uh, you know, the, the, a special recipe from a certain chef that won't get shared around necessarily. So what, uh, what are your favorite recipes in, in the cookbook? Do you have a couple of favorites, Ruth? Um, I wouldn't say I have any favourites because the thing about anybody who, who loves to cook is that you just love so many dishes. There are some that I use quite frequently, um, especially for things like parties and what have you. If I've got to cook, if I've got 20 people coming around for Christmas or for a Christmas party, there's certain things that uh, work really well for occasions. But, you know, that equally, I, 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 I do like to just go to the fridge, open the fridge door and go... Oh, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that. Oh, I can make that. So, yeah, it's very much hit, I wouldn't say hit and miss, it's very much in, invention, really. That's, I, I have one. I'm not claiming to be any kind of chef <laughs> at all, but I call it the kitchen omelette. I mean, the, the fridge yeah. omelette. And it's, you open it, and whatever's left in the fridge gets tossed in, and it yep. makes a wonderful omelet and it's all the leftovers so that you don't have to worry about food you know going to waste because that's another thing you know so so much food is wasted yeah and if it can be used in a recipe that's it uh, so i know that we're dividing the cookbook into um two parts yeah it's um the seasons so we're going to go by seasons so it's spring and summer and then we have autumn and winter. Yeah. Uh, those are, uh, are there ones that are easier is, is winter that thinks of the Christmas holidays and such. Are those recipes, do they take a little longer or they're extra special ones? They, I think winter food tends to be slower cooking, your casseroles and your pies and, and things like that. So. They may, they can take longer, but again, they can be done, a lot of them can be done in a slow cooker if you have to work and you don't have that sort of time. Uh, a few seasonal ones, um, sometimes uh, I've put in uh, gifts, Christmas, uh, edible Christmas gifts that you can make, things like biscotti and um, chili jellies and thing, stuff that you can give away 
I, mean, I do every year. I'm, I'm such a cheapskate. <laughs> I make all my Christmas <laughs> presents for friends. <laughs> Well, that's not being a cheapskate, to be honest. Uh, when I watch the cooking shows, when it comes to the holidays, they're saying how special it is to have that kind of gift because it, you've made it personally. So it's something that you've made for someone. It's a part of you that you're giving. I think those are so much more special. When it comes to biscotti and the jellies, how is uh, when you create a new recipe, how do you do that? Do you just pick something or? I feel uh, to be honest, I mean, there's there's really no such thing as a new recipe because th most of these dishes have been around for donkey's years. Uh, and I think most chefs have have their own repertoire of dishes that they've made for donkey's years. And many of them are classics and actually are, especially in patisserie, everything is exact and you can't really change it. On other dishes, um, you have freedom to to sort of play around and you get inspiration from seeing other chefs' dishes or going out to eat somewhere and you go back and you go, okay, I'll take that, but I might just do this and I'll tweak that. And But at the end of the day, poulet normand is poulet normand. It's chicken with with with, ap with apples and things and, and wine. So whilst the recipe, the, bake, the original idea is the same, every chef tweaks the original idea uh, and has, diff you know, might have just different, ratios of ingredients or might put something else in which wasn't in the original um it's, it's very hard it's in fact it's not impossible to create a new dish really it's all kind of standard ingredients so i have a, a personal question my mom when she would a good you know a scottish cook you know from the old school and she would make mince or stew beef she would put a little bit of allspice in it yeah uh, is is that because my mum did it? I always thought it was normal. Is that is that a... quite, quite adventurous, really? Uh, I mean, a lot of I think now a lot of people because we have influences from other countries. You know, if you do minced beef, a lot of people put a bit of cumin or coriander in because, and it's it's not making it Indian as such. But I mean, because a lot of Middle Eastern dishes use use cumin and coriander and and smoked paprika and things. So. Really, we, we, we're sort of, I think it's great now that we have the internet and everything and we can get so many recipes from abroad because we're getting more and more fusion dishes and things that you used to think, oh, you can't put that with that, can you? And actually, yes, you can. And, and, and create something that's a fusion of two different cultures, but actually works really well. And I think people get very, very sort of, you know, this is, this is a hot pot. You don't, you don't mess around with a hot pot. Or you don't mess around with, with souvlaki or whatever but actually when you start fusing things you come up with something that's sometimes even better <laughs> and savory and sweet the you know the combination of flavors mm. because then it touches yeah. i think the sensory parts of the tongue so if you've got mm. savory sweet and they add the vinegar and different little bits and pieces um mm. a recipe i heard of and they were doing um uh, spaghetti sauce and they put a wee bit sugar in it and i tried it oh sugar in i always put any tomato sauce i always put a, a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of sugar because unfortunately living in a colder climate like we do although not so much this year um things like tomatoes don't get the flavor that they get in it's had in italy and france where they have such a hot climate you know they're, they're much sweeter and more flavorsome over there so putting a, especially in the winter time putting a little bit of sugar in with your tomato sauce can, rounds it up completely it makes it much much nicer yeah it was a richer flavor i i really mm. love that and i've always listened to people and try wee bits and pieces although sometimes you know a sandwich a messy sandwich is what i love a good burger <laughs> with lots of stuff on it you know like the kid <laughs> a fridge burger you just throw everything on it yes what would you say to um I'm a semi neophyte when it comes to cooking. I've done a little bit, but to people who really want the basic for beginning, beginning cooking, whether they're younger or middle aged, to where should they start? Where's the best place to start, Ruth? Um, get a good. I mean, I, I, Delia Smith kept brought out her cookbooks for complete beginners. She uh, said almost pretty much from how to boil an egg. I can't remember what they were called, but they. And also the Master Chef Kitchen Bible, I think it was called, and they show you techniques right from very basics. Uh, if you can, once you've learned the basics, how to make a, a white sauce, bechamel sauce, how to chop an onion, 
how to sort of saute something, how to make a basic stew, how to make soup. I'm just, I'm just amazed that people go out and buy a soup maker or buy soup in a, pa- in a, in a plastic tub. If you've got a fridge full of ingredients, let's face it, we all go out and buy far too much vegetables. You open your fridge drawer, your, your, your vegetable drawer, and you can make some amazing soups with the stuff that's kind of going a little bit limp and you think, mm, better chuck it. You don't have to chuck it, turn it into a soup. I have so many friends that do that and, you know, they've got the leftovers or this, whatever it might be, and they just throw it in and make a soup. And I have, I will admit, Ruth, I've been afraid to try that. And I, even with my veg and such, and I use it till it's absolutely Mm -hmm. gone, but I always think, oh, so if I wanted to start with very simple soup, a basic kind of vegetable soup, what kind of stock should I use? Is, Is it one of the cube stocks or should I like boil a chicken or what's the best way to start it when you first start use a, use a stock cube or the little stock jellies but once you get into it if ever i have a roast chicken and you're taking all the meat off the chicken stick the chicken in a pot just just big enough to take it cover it with water chuck half an onion and a couple of carrots in and just let it simmer for an hour or so strain it off and you've got chicken soup chicken chicken stock and, and just freeze it. I've got lots of uh, ice cream tubs or whatever, and just free, freeze the stock in the ice cream tubs. Same with fish. If you've, I don't know, n- nobody's going to take a whole salmon home and fillet it. But if you go, if you're buying a side of salmon for Christmas or whatever, ask the the butcher for the the butcher or the fish mugger for the bones. Chuck those fish bones in a saucepan in a saucepan. Just cover it with water, and again a little bit of some uh, onion or whatever, and just boil it for half an hour and strain it, and you've got fish stock. But if you're just starting out, buy the buy the stock cubes or buy the little stock jelly pots. They're fine. They're absolutely fine. All right. Well, you have inspired me, Ruth. I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm actually going to try a soup. I think all of the friends will be just like dominoes falling over each other, <laughs> thinking of me doing it's it. some soups. Things like I mean, ideally, if you, I mean, leek and potato. So simple. Just chop up some some leeks bit of butter just sweat them off a bit chuck your potatoes in chuck your stock in leave it to simmer for 20 minutes and blitz it with a hand blender I I recommend everybody goes out and buys a little hand blender because they are so useful for so many things especially if you're making soups okay uh, hand blender I'll okay I'll add that to my in my air fryer and and then my my kitchen will be outfitted I still I learned um from my mom so I still peel potatoes the old way old-fashioned with a wee paring knife you know just because I'm used to it so I have all the old-fashioned kind of blender things so I have a bit of those but I love hearing about new recipes and trying new things so Mm. For um, I, we've got the books will have your favorite recipes and lots of them, which I'm delighted to see. And uh, since I've been reviewing it, I, I have to say I've got one complaint. Every time I read the recipe and see the picture, I was like, okay, can I have it now to eat, please? <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> it looks absolutely delectable, I have to say. So we'll probably do another uh, podcast uh, in a few weeks time to follow up for what we're doing. What I would like to mention is that we are doing a crowdfunding campaign uh, through ArcBound. Well, it's through CrowdBound, which is a part of the charity ArcBound. We will be raising the money for um, the publication of the book because we want it to be a stellar uh, color production and to give quality to the recipes that that Ruth has created here and and done. So we're going to put a link on it. We are going to have special offers for everyone. So we'll offer, there'll be the two books, depending on which season you want, or you can have both. We're going to have extra little special goodies and giveaways, which will uh, be in the description. Also in the description will be the link to where you can uh, give your contribution. And we will be working on the release date, which is anticipated to be towards uh, Black Friday in Thanksgiving so that everybody will be able to receive their book in time for Christmas. We will be having ongoing episodes uh, for podcasts and such. Uh, as we, as Ruth did mention, we the funds will be benefiting the Macmillan. And just so everybody knows, uh, this is a cost only book. So although we're producing it, it's cost only. We are not going to keep, be keeping any internal funds 
everything will be going to the donated charity which will be directed by so i'm quite proud of that uh, we do have a commitment to community uh, Ruth, would you like to describe how uh, the, the support that you received when you were first diagnosed from Macmillan and the other charities? Oh, well, uh, right from the word go, when you first start going to for your chemo, there, I actually was also taking part in a chemo drug trial uh, at, the, at the start of my treatment. Uh, and the Macmillan nurses were amazing. They'd chat to you every time, every time I went in, they'd you know, do, do a survey and just see how you're getting on. But they offer so much support throughout but also end of life care and things and and how to just come to terms with the fact that you're not going to live forever that it's that it's you know it, it is life limiting and working out how you're going to sort things with your family and friends and, and also financial problems yeah you know, if you, when you get cancer suddenly for a lot of people they can't work or thing, the various things happen and the cost of going to the hospitals and things Macmillan are really good at helping you uh, with 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 various sort of yeah, all sorts of support, financial and ad advice, one way or another. Uh, I have to say, for those in the audience who don't know this, I have also been a beneficiary of Macmillan when I was diagnosed uh, a few years ago, and uh, thankfully I went through surgery and radiation, didn't need the chemo, and I'm on the other end of it. I haven't reached that five year bit, but I'm cl I'm getting closer all the time. <laughs> But Macmillan did. I I came to it from confusion of what do I do? How do I do? What do I do next? You know, financial, the guidance, where do I go for anything? Uh, so it's been a major contributing factor. Has there been a local charity for you that's in your area, Ruth? Because I know you live in England. Not specifically. I mean, also for some people that uh, that find they that they the, the treatment of really harsh I, uh, it was quite handy to go to there was a local charity on, off the top of my head I think it's closed now but it would give you advice about how to get financial support and also if, if you needed PIPs you know personal independent payments if, if you know if you find that especially if you're if it's life limiting you get less and less able to walk as far or or a friend of mine has has uh, facial cancer um, and was died with late diagnosis, and he is also terminal. But he but he gets he can get social pips because people don't understand what he's saying sometimes because he's he's you know he's, he's had so many operations on his head that you know on a, if his head makes phone calls and things it's really hard and you know be able to get advice and again Macmillan will tell you where to go to get advice to support you through whatever you're going through. Um, and I have to say, um, part of what Macmillan did for me was I was um, guided to two, two local charities that made a huge impact, uh, Rainbow Valley, and they assisted me with counseling and, uh, uh, you know, we went away for two days just in the middle of it. And it took you away mm. with people who are in the same boat as you are. And I think, Ruth, that you will agree, people who are in that same boat understand in yeah, a different absolutely. way. Yeah. And, uh, and then the other one is, is Maggie's, which is very local in Glasgow next to the right. hospital. And they provided uh, great assistance for ongoing care as to, you know, making yourself feel better with cosmetic days, uh, mindfulness and Tai Chi. So I think um, another bit of advice to anyone who's listening is go to Macmillan. They will help guide you in the yeah. large. Right. Yes, yeah, they'll point you in the direction to get, yeah. Yes, yeah. and point you in the direction of others who can give you more localized help, which I think is yeah. really important. Yeah. Because support during that time it, from family is wonderful, emotional support from friends, but from those who, as I said, are going through the same thing, have a special understanding. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and what we want to do with it, you know, and talk or not, or whatever it might be. So yeah. we'll have links for all of those in, in our description, obviously. Uh, so I'm going to uh, end on a happy note because I want to talk about the patisserie. What is your favorite pastry to make that you <laughs> um, I I like making a baked New York cheesecake. <sighs> 
all right that's one on my list a good new york cheesecake is just to die for the the texture yeah. and flavor that hits it and then that crumbly crust yeah yeah have you ever done a key lime pie i have yes and that's quite easy to make really because it's i mean it's evaporated milk and, and limes and, and yeah it's actually relatively slight i don't think i put it in the book might have to do that one Oh, all right. That'll be one of the special ones we'll give out. So, so for those who have listened to the podcast, you'll get that special one. Uh, anything else that you would like to give uh, advice to uh, our listening audience, Ruth, regarding either the cancer or uh, cooking or baking in a general sense? Not really, but I do think if, if you're a little bit nervous of cooking, just Get in there and give it a try because the more you do it, the, the more adept you get at it and the more you really like work out why this happens and that happens. And once you get into it, you can get hooked very quickly. As, as I'm sure I will once I start the soup. I just have to start the soup. <laughs> it could be it like sourdough. <laughs> I, got, I, started, you know, I started seeing some sort of sourdough recipes and thought, hmm, I might have to give that a go. Made my own starter and now I've been making sourdough with the same starter for the last 10 years probably <laughs> oh wow that's amazing to think of that one little bit will start it off and so sourdough is one of my favorite breads it's yeah. yeah there's a new one that smelt rye and uh wheat and oh my gosh that's wonderful I love <laughs> fresh baked breads which will go perfectly with the uh soup i'm gonna make exactly <laughs> <laughs> you get those. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot, Ruth, because I didn't say anything about it before, but we always do a shout out at the end of our podcast. Who um, is there any uh, single person or a group, a, someone special you'd like to do a shout out to for the podcast? Well, I have to say my family, really, for being so supportive and my daughter, who's been pretty supportive and, and the one that got me on this road in the first place, actually doing the cookbook. But all my, yeah, all my friends have been amazing. Uh, and I just, I just love to be social and, and spend time with them. So the more time I get to do that, the better. Absolutely. Every day is precious to us. And I think once we've been through it, I had a, a friend who's gone through prostate cancer and is on the other side of it. And we all recognize each day is special, recognize that one, and then we can get on with the rest of it. So, yeah. because we can't assume anything. So, as a special chef and special guest, I want to thank you so much. Uh, thank you. As I said, we're, we're going to have a follow-up podcast uh, in November before the release of the book. But in the meantime, I would like to remind everyone, um, this has been a Zoom. So if you've heard anything untoward, you know it's because Ruth is in England and Michelle is in Scotland and never the twins shall meet. Please download the episode. I thank you very much. It's Michelle from Jasami Bookworm Podcast. As always, wishing you a sunny day. 